joining us in our hell, yeah, conversation <laughs> uh, about words becomes flesh and issues and things and topics that may arise and anything that these two gentlemen want to talk about. Um, if you're not familiar with 651 Arts, I ask you to please go to our website, please join us. Uh, we have a series coming up um, beginning January 26th called Live and Outspoken, where artists interview other artists, and there's also a performative aspect to it. We open the season with a conversation with Nicholas Ech uh, Lecter, who's a dancer, and he will be uh, interviewed by uh, Issa Davis, a theater artist, playwright, writer, uh, etc. We have three other ones coming up, but that's not what we are here about. But I, uh, we, you'll have information in your program. So when you go see the play, if you're going to see it today at four o'clock, there's more information inside of that. Uh, we are happy to have Marco Muti Joseph, who is the writer and director of Word Become Flesh, to be here in this intimate setting to talk to you. And he's going to be interviewed by Kenyon Farrell. And Kenyon is a former theater artist. He is now an activist and writer who lives in New York City. And he has a forthcoming book called The, tell me the title. Uh, uh, Stand Up. <laughs> Stand Up. Uh, the yes. Politics of Racial Uplift exactly. uh, on the Southern Press. Yeah, so he's a very prolific uh, blogger and uh, writer and thinker about contemporary um, issues around social justice, justice politics, and creativity. Uh, uh, Kenyon did have a chance to see the performance, so he will be you know, talking to Mark and sharing thoughts and ideas and comments and concerns uh, around the play. So we have about 40 minutes, and um, then folks will be going up to see the show, hopefully. If not, uh, we have to end so that those who are can get there. All right, thank you. And I turn it over to you, Kenyon. Cool. Um, thank you very much. Um, for inviting me to be here. Um, I got an opportunity to see the show last night, as you just heard, and I'll try not to uh, you know, do too much uh, spoiling <laughs> of the events. I'll just try to be conscious of, of that uh, as we discuss um, Words Become Flesh. Um, and I, I guess I'll just say um, one of my thoughts um, opening up. One, I just was really uh, moved by the performance um, for a number of reasons that I think we'll, we'll sort of touch on. Um, but one I just think um, is kind of interesting from uh, a sort of political level is, um, you know, we're in election season. And what's been interesting to me in the last um, several weeks is um, ways in which I feel like the culture wars have returned um, from the 1980s. You know, we're hearing, you know, GOP candidates, you know, talk about, you know, people with AIDS as deserving and their fault and therefore should pay higher insurance. We're hearing, you know, um, you know, this kind of narrative again about like, you know, black people on welfare, through which is usually targeted at black women, but like sort of absentee black fathers is often a part of the, the secondary piece of, of that um, kind of political conversation. And so I think, um, you know, for that particular reason, um, this uh, show is really, really important right now. And I, and I would say for another reason, too, that um, in many ways, uh, in 2008, Barack Obama's um, candidacy and his perhaps just relationship with Michelle and the kids sort of Reemerged a, a sort of conversation about like sort of black fatherhood in the last um, you know four years. Um, so I, I think um, you know this piece is um, kind of fitting um, at a particular time where I feel like we're going to be hearing more of these debates um, in some good ways and not so good ways um, <laughs> over over the course of this election year. Um, so I, I guess um, to that. Uh, sort of point, um, I'll just sort of ask you, sort of how do you see um, this particular piece fitting within kind of a, a larger kind of conversation? It happens in the black community, certainly, and, and certainly happens outside of it, you know, about black people. <coughs> um, we are in a political season, um, but it's always winter in America. <laughs> and the dismantling of the black family structure is actually an American ideal, um, as much as capitalism is, um, as much as imperialism is. 
um, the very presence of African-descended people in the Americas is made possible by the deconstruction of the black family structure. So yes, it's the season, but the continuum that we're talking about is a, you know, a 500 year timeline. In the immediate sense, and, and by immediate I mean the last 50 years, let's say, um, in the United States, probably beginning with um, the civil rights era and the, the post-civil rights era, the introduction of, um, of drugs into um, black and brown communities in an intentional and genocidal way. Um, the ways that um, the public school system in America fails all of our children, but beginning with Prop 13 in California, the very specific and systematic deconstruction of successful public school systems tied to, um, to tax rates. All these things, I think, form the backdrop um, along with uh, kind of the systems of patriarchy and male privilege. All these things form the backdrop of a conversation of, about what it means to be present in the life that you brought into the world. There are all these um, systemic um, pillars that um, ground us in opposition and compartmentalize um, and deconstruct the black family structure in the United States. So given all those isms and given all those big ideas, I think I just really want to talk about love. <laughs> and um, how it is that um, we don't love our kids. How it is that, um, that issues of self-love or self-definition or self-determination um, occupy our practice of sharing similar love with the unborn and, and those um, that are born in, into our families. And so for you know, all the systems, for all the major pathologies, I, I think that part of what we're trying to explore in this piece is just um, emotional continuity. Um, integrating a sense of self as part of the same continuum as um, the sense of responsibility and accountability for another. And I think that, you know, as you introduce talks of, you know, culture wars, I think what I'm struck by most is just a lack, a general lack of compassion, the polarity, the, um, the polemical discussions that we have in our politics lack compassion. Um, and this, too, is an ethos that I think is present in our inability to, um, you know, to fully love our kids. So you know, like, just kind of big macro issues aside, um, what we try to do with the piece is um, create a small, intimate, sweaty, narrowed and visceral account of why a brother might leave. And also, given those things, why we might choose to stay how we might sever the cycles just by um, undergoing a process of self-evaluation and just being humble enough to then be accountable to pass on a different set of values um, onto someone else. Yeah, I think, um, you know, seeing it yesterday, you definitely see um, in, the, in the work this um, sort of discussion of, you know, I mean, what I think is true for people generally is to be concerned about like the sort of, you know, meta or kind of outside forces that are shaping one's, uh, what feel like the, the ability to make certain kinds of decisions and, um, and then one's own personal kind of drive and wishes and desires and um, sense of future, right? And how mm -hmm. people are navigating um, becoming fathers mm -hmm. um, in that, um, with both of those, the personal and the political, um, 
in, uh, both at play. Um, but I also just want to give you an opportunity to talk about um, the, the process of, um, of developing the production and maybe just talk about what it was like um, you know, to work with the other actors um, on this particular script. Um, okay, so first, anybody else a dad here? Interesting. <laughs> so, um, in the months that my partner was pregnant, um, I, I think I think the months of her pregnancy were the loneliest months of my life, um, for a whole bunch of reasons, but primarily because um, I didn't feel like I had anybody to talk to. I, I didn't feel like anybody um, could understand. I felt like mom was pregnant and we were all focused on her and we should be, you know what I mean? I, I didn't know where my outlets were. Um, I didn't, there weren't other cats that I knew that were, that were having kids. Um, you know, and part of all the ugliness in America that we just described um, has resulted in a whole bunch of black men who don't have their dads and who also kind of have a social pass to leave. So I don't really have any immediate role models. I didn't have the greatest relationship with my own dad. So the, the process started really because I felt at the time, like the only person I could really talk to was my son, but he wasn't born yet. So I wrote, <laughs> so I started writing these letters, wow. just about what I was going through, but addressed them to him, and um, ended up codifying these letters and organizing these letters in a performed way um, uh, in 2003. And um, I performed the show as a solo piece first for almost two and a half years um, all over the world and was done <laughs> for real. Wrote other stuff, performed another stuff, was cool. And um, the National Performance Network um, approached me to um, reimagine the work um, two years ago. And the trip at the time was Tyler Perry was doing um, for colored girls who considered suicide when rainbow is enough, which is a whack movie. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's so, it's so whack. Okay, you know, okay, yeah. I mean, the the book is um, a piece of genius that has inspired me and countless other writers. Um, I thought that the movie, you, you know, I, I think that we all do our best, um, but the way that black men in particular were portrayed um, in the movie, I, th I thought was um, reprehensible. In part because the, the, the text wasn't meant to represent black men in any other way. So, you know, dude did what he had to do, but in the meantime, the, you know, on the large screen, what gets played out or what got played out was um, kind of a, a repetition of the pathologies of black men in America. And so, seeing that, part of what I wanted to do was um, re-engage with that particular text. This idea of an ensemble that, in Entezaki Shange's case, could articulate um, common and disparate narratives of black womanhood and create um, an analogous narrative um, with black men. I'm really fortunate to work with the Brave New Voices Network, which is a crew of young poets in every city in the United States that um, comes together on an annual basis at the Brave New Voices Festival. Each poet is between 13 and 19 years old. And so in creating this piece or recreating this piece, um, the young men of Brave New Voices, these five in particular, along with our DJ Dion Decibels, they were the first folks that um, I engaged and casted because they're so adept with verse, um, they're so exemplary on 
racial and political lines, and they just bust crazy hard and they're hungry. Yeah. So, um, so that was the process from loneliness to solo performance to um, just kind of being through and ready to move on, and then in retaliation and in conversation, and also in kind of um, uh, pedagogical extension, you know, um, using the process to be an extended teaching moment, and then finally through the manifestation in, in its current form with young men, all under 40, some under um, 20, you know, really um, telling this story, and I think hopefully a, a different kind of vision of what it is to be black male in America. Wow. You know, it's, I'm <laughs> glad you brought up a couple things. I, I think one, um, I mean, when I saw it, I, I, the uh, kind of reference to uh, Tendazaki Shantes for Color Girls was, I, I, like, yeah, could very well um, kind of feel it, uh, uh, kind of grappling with that text text as response, but, but, not as, but not as response as um, antagonism. Right. It's interesting, though, to hear your opinion, which I happen to share, about the Tyler Perry film. Um, and, and it is a general kind of, to me, a narrative throughout his work about, um, I felt like that part of my problem with that film, one of which was that um, the, it actually also withdrew all of the places within the original Shange text where women actually have sexual agency and pleasure mm. as part of like it, it actually just pulls all of that out mm. um, and doesn't deal like doesn't actually portray much of that mm. stuff that's in the original text and I was like that's interesting mm. um, so just my two cents on that um, the other you know thing that I was struck by um, in in the performance last night was just the, the actual physical use of the black male body in space in ways that um, the, 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 the physicality of the show, um, you know, obviously has a lot of, um, of kind of, you know, dance and movement vocabulary in that way, but was so original in the sense that I didn't feel like I was watching a dance performance per se and saw um, just the sort of way uh, the, you know, people use their bodies in ways that we just, you know, that just seemed really, really new and fresh in terms of ways in which that in and of itself, I think, works to kind of force people to deconstruct the way black men are sort of viewed. Mm -hmm. um, and that there was a real both kind of strength, there was a vulnerability, there was awkwardness, there was, um, there was a whole kind of range of, um, of those uh, things. So if you could speak a little bit about the physicality of uh, the, the movement um, as, it, as you see it in this particular piece. Uh, you know, I, I first started dancing formally when I was 10 and, um, you know, was involved in musical theater and was on Broadway as a kid. And so, so dance has always been a really viable and very accessible point of re reference for me. Um, also, anybody who's, you know, who lives in New York, but, you know, if you're a citizen of the world, you just, you know, you just know the black male body and the, and the pose and how much is communicated through really all of us, not black men, really all of us, just what we wear and how we sit and, and what we do. There's um, perhaps um, an exaggerated um, way um, that body language is so clear and so focal, and especially in our neighborhoods, the way um, your body language will determine whether you survive or not. Um, and so, again, that's all like metaphor ephemera. The idea that spoken language and body language exist on the same continuum and are used to communicate the same ideas, or can be used to communicate the same ideas, isn't very political at all for me. It's really educational. It really comes from um, being an English teacher and wanting to get at, um, let's say, an idea. In order to get at an idea, to get at one idea in the classroom, you probably have to present it four different ways. 
because there are multiple intelligences in the room and there are multiple learning styles in the room. So when I started to develop work, the, the things that I could immediately access were spoken language and body language as a way to communicate one idea. Um, and hopefully as I've developed in my work, I've gotten a little bit better or a little bit more sophisticated in um, not compartmentalizing those things or not isolating those things, but really seeing them as one seamless form to get at a series of ideas. The body is an abstract entity. And so there are things that are communicated through the body that if, you know, that kind of eliminate the need to hear them spoken literally. But as poets and as students of verse, we know that, especially in the spoken word idiom, there's so much kind of literal linear force that it helps to have um, the body as a metaphorical tool so that the literal and the figurative are operating at the same time. So that's like all the form and structure of it. Um, and then there is the political. There is the politicization of um, the black male body. We talk about from the cotton field to the athletic field to the digital plantation, you know, and all those things are present in um, kind of the strength and the visceral nature of the piece. Also, and probably lastly, um, I love the integration of media design in theater and dance, but I don't go to the theater to watch TV. <laughs> so I want, I want theater that sweats. I want theater that bleeds. And I want to be able to feel it. And so all that breath, all that grunting, all that, mm, that that's intentional. Because there's a way that I think many of us are um, prioritizing technology over the folkloric and ritualistic nature of the body telling story. And so um, our emphasis is to um, prioritize the body over screens, which is why there are none um, in this piece. And I think that also works for the kind of story we're telling and the bodies that are sharing it in space. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, was there anything you were uh, afraid in the script to put out into the world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my story and so it's just hella personal and so it's um, it's cathartic and it's healing for me um, you know but every night that I watch it there's still parts where I'm like oh I said that or oh I felt that you know and um, there are moments where I really value my anonymity inside of the relationship of the work. When I was performing it as a solo piece, there was nowhere to run, you know? But the process of writing it was the healing. And then I went into this purgatory for a couple of years where it was just like, here's the lesson again, <laughs> and again the next night, and twice on Sunday, you know? So um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I was like afraid, um, but there's parts of the work that still hurt. I mean, I, I thought it was um, the level of honesty um, in it about just a range of different conflicted feelings that, you know, in this case, men have about being fathers, but anybody parenting certainly, um, you know, have. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> certainly wondered about the, yeah, that aspect of, uh, you know, just feeling uh, like, yeah, the... Emotionality of, of, and some of the, some of it fairly controversial, right? In, in that respect. Um, so your son is seven, eight now. He's like, he's gonna vote. <laughs> what? Are you no, 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 he's ten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he's two thousand three. I'm like, yeah, the years. No, no, <laughs> um, has he seen it? Yep. And what have the conversations been like about 
the show. You know, the really cool thing is that um, uh, my son is developing into his own being, and um, his own artist, and he's 10, so he's really mature and sweet, but he's also like, so like, the, the things that he, you know, he knows what he needs to know, and um, his mom and I decided that he doesn't need to see the show again. Like, he's right at the cusp where he doesn't need to see it, which is awesome. Um, mostly, there hasn't been direct conversation about the show. The conversation that's happening is in his art. You know, there's this whole um, opening credo, uh, welcome to the spoken world, the living word, the dream deferred, reverse, return back. You know, he knows it, and he can do it. You know, he can do the choreography, he can do, you know, he can do the text. Um, he's writing poems and he's referencing Mumia Abu Jamal and he's referencing Frederick Douglass in his poems. He's dancing, he's making these stop animate, you know, he's discovered, um, first he discovered iMovie and now he's on Final Cut Pro and he's making all these stop motion um, animation films. Wow. And so I don't think he's like, oh, that play is about me. Let me talk to you about this play. Yeah. I think he's like, oh, theater, dance. This is the world that I'm in. This is how I make my shit. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, like, and I think that that's what's most present in terms of the conversation. It's not like one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. It's more like he's a 10-year-old filmmaker. He has right. his own YouTube channel. You know what I mean? Like he's on that, and I think that that's um, more of his response than anything else. Um, what's the what's the future hold for you? This production and beyond. Um, you know, I'm thrilled to be at Under the Radar here, and thankful to Shay and the staff at Six Fifty One Arts, and to Mark Russell and May Yin and Under the Radar and the public for um, making a space for the piece to continue to live. Um, I first was here at Under the Radar with this piece when it was a solo performance, so it's, um, it's come full circle. And the great thing about it being at Under the Radar right now is that lots of folks um, who have access can continue to give it life in, you know, in other venues, so that's awesome. Um, we premiered it in um, December of 2010 in Dallas. And I think this is the eighth city that it's been in, um, and will be in the San Francisco Bay Area in um, in February. Um, so I'm really pleased with the life that it's had and the numbers of people that you know that have seen the work. Um, you know, like I said, everybody in the piece is crazy young and hungry and talented. They're all MCs, musicians, playwrights singer-songwriters on their own, and they all have viable individual stories to tell and are playing with form in terms of how to tell them. So to me, the greatest success of the piece will be what those you know, six dudes do individually in terms of making music and, you know, and so forth. Um, um, I think the piece will continue to tour a little bit longer. Um, you know, it's um, been canonized or it's been anthologized in, um, um, by Theater Communications Group, and so it's a viable text for folks to read. And I think that the best thing um, that happened in the piece Leaving My Body is it became, um, you know, practical and accessible for, um, for a company of five or six or seven to take on um, these different pieces and to perform them themselves. And that's what I'm really hoping um, that happens. I think most of us that are in solo performance write for our bodies, and so it's a very close fit. And not enough of us, I think, um, conceive of solo performance as something to be performed by someone else. You know what I mean? I think Nalaja Sun has been one of the more successful folks that have done this in creating a piece, No Child, that was for her that other women have then, you know, taken on. But what Danny Hawk does, that's Danny Hawk. Right. You know what I mean? Right. What Sarah Jones does, that's you know, Sarah Jones, and I think most of us in solo performance create from that perspective. So I'm really happy that it's an ensemble work. I hope young people and old people and whoever else, you know, continue to manifest the work. Um, and then in terms of um, my own practice, 
it's really twofold. Um, I just debuted a new piece. It's called Red, Black, and Green, a blues. Um, it premiered um, last year and continues to tour around the country. It'll be at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in October. Um, and it's a piece that I'm really proud of. And so a lot of my arts practice is in the continuing um, performance of that work and in continuing to write librettos for um, ballet companies and dance companies in particular. Um, and I'm also the new director of performing arts at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. So I have a, um, a curatorial practice of bringing in other groups, commissioning other folks, and contextualizing performance, I think, in new and exciting ways for the Bay Area, um, along with my colleagues up and down um, the West Coast and, and around the world. I think we may have a couple moments, so um, I want to, yeah, so I want to open it up uh, to folks who had questions. It's your opportunity to ask the artist <laughs> before you see the work. Cool. <laughs> oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. so much of the integrity to be able to travel um, and to their own work, to be able to tour and see the world like and see what, it, what their art looks like from the outside in, which yeah. helps so much. And I know a lot of them are very hungry, so I just wanted to say that. And I thought it was a really piece of work. Can make a flippant comment, you know, 
six, seven years ago, and someone rescued that flippant comment, and Glenn Beck takes it, subverts it, deconstructs it, and all of a sudden he's out of the White House. Like that, you know, that kind of machinery is why you don't have more artists or athletes just kind of stepping up and speaking out because there's this corporate, sterilized um, filter on um, the mouths and consequently the, the actions of folks that are in prominent positions to, you know, to speak out. Keith Olbermann, who was on MSNBC, you know, a progressive channel, and who, you know, every other night would just go off for 15 minutes about somebody. You know, he gave some money to a candidate, and it's like, you know what dude's politics are. You know what dude's politics are. That's why he's up. And he was censored. You know what I mean? Um, you know, John Stewart, all, you know, all these folks. There's a, there's a very tiny threshold um, in the corporate structure for activism. We want our national spokespeople to be um, as sterile as possible. Um, Kelly Clarkson, you know, tweeted, which I know is a, a hundred, less than 140 characters, Kelly Clarkson tweeted that she dug Ron Paul. And you know, there are darts thrown at her. So it's like, she can't even express a political opinion. You know what I mean? The Dixie, the Dixie chase. I mean, just yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just just on and on and on. So, you know, when um, when the United States went into war in Iraq, you know, anybody that spoke out against the war in Iraq was you know immediately vilified. You know what I mean? Um, and it's just like, where have we gone? You know, where you can't say war is whack. <laughs> like, who are we? You know what I mean? So I. You know, to, with all due respect to, you know, Reverend Sharpton and growing up here in New York City, a lot of my political vocabulary was shaped by Reverend Al just kind of going off, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, with all due respect, I, I think that it's less about active artists and more about um, a highly sensitive, um, you know, low threshold corporate structure that doesn't give visibility or license to artists that are speaking out. And what I just would offer too in terms of the music industry that might actually offer some, I don't know, hope or whatever, a, a, a shift, is, um, you know, nobody's selling records anymore. I mean, that's the, <laughs> no one is selling, I mean, there's like a very few, like Beyonce, Rihanna, Lady Gaga are the only people selling <laughs> records right now. Nobody else is selling, nobody's even going platinum, like nobody's selling a million records anymore. But there are a lot more people selling 20,000, you know, 50,000, 100,000. And I think, you know, that in and of itself may shake up um, some of the kind of um, political control over what gets out, just because people don't have to be so reliant on a record label for distribution anymore. Like, you know, people have found other ways around it. So that's, that I would say is one of the um, hopes I have, that some of this other stuff can be uh, undermined. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of folks that I've been inspired by, and Tazaki Shange probably um, first among them. And, um, yeah, there's really just a, a, a long list, I'll say, of folks that um, inspired me to, to move into the field. Um, I, I think that, you know, I saw Danny Hawk in a park somewhere mm -hmm. in the um, in the nineties do this um, riff, man. You know, I I don't know how old I maybe I was nineteen. I, I 
forget how old I was, but man, I saw him go off. He, you know, it was it was a piece from jails, um, hospitals, and hip hop, and um, I knew I couldn't do what he did, but he was speaking my language. I remember being a junior in high school and going to PS one twenty two, and there was this piece, um, um, "What's Happening Now," and Crazy Legs was in it, and all these B boys were in it, and I was like, "That's hip hop. I, I can touch that." When I was 15, there was, um, there's a playwright named Bill Kane, who um, is this incredible playwright. He wrote this um, piece. Um, he was still, and I think he is still, a practicing Jesuit priest. But it was this piece called um, Stand Up Tragedy that I was in. That was, and, um, and that was really instrumental and, you know, and important to me. Um, and then, of course, of course, August Wilson. So, yeah. Um, right. So, so folks, <laughs> folks I can touch, folks I will never know. Um, in terms of, um, you know, maybe intimidation or um, separation inside of the field, I don't know, I don't really, not so much. You know, because it's, it's part of my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, it's just part of my life. So, yeah, exactly. So it's no different. You know what I mean? It's no different. Like, I, I could be in any field. I, you know, I could be running for president. I could be running for student council. It, it's all kind of the, the same thing. Um, the challenge, I think, is the normalization of narrative and how that fits into um, the context of your average presenting season. By that I mean, you know, I feel like I go to, you know, a, a lot of plays or a lot of dance, and the canon that they're referencing is, you know, French philosophers and Russian novelists and German composers, and you know what I mean? There's like a certain, you know, like I'm supposed to know that this was based on a Dostoevsky, and I'm supposed to know that they're referencing Mahler when they, they you know what I mean? Um, and so normalizing the, a consistent reference to Du Bois or to Hughes or to Shange or to Sanchez or to Lemon Anderson, you know what I mean? Like normalizing those things is actually part of my challenge as a curator to create um, a context by which audiences can um, absorb and practice and become versed in a different kind of literacy. Um, that's my curatorial challenge. My challenge as writer and performer is just to be as true to my personal convictions as possible. And I think the kind of person that I am, and this also speaks to just my being, is, um, you know, like I'm, I'm inclined towards empathy. And I'm a pretty good code switcher. So I practice that in my art. Again, I'm much more, um, I, would, I would much rather create an environment than to create a dogmatic lecture um, in my educational practice and in my arts practice. So, yeah. Cool. Well, um, let's give our playwrights a round of applause. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, pre-performance talk and hope that you enjoy the show.